All right, welcome everyone. My name is Saad Ali. I'm very lucky to introduce Rohan and Jose from Red Hat. They're going to be talking about raw block volumes today. Uh, so to put this into context for you, if you're familiar with the Kubernetes uh, volume uh, subsystem, what you're going to know is that for the most part, uh, the system allows you to access uh, volumes as files with a file system applied to it, and you'll have a uh, directory mounted into your container. And when you read and write files to that directory, um, you know it'll be available to you. It'll be persisted out. Um, there are some subset of applications that don't like to interact with volumes through a file system interface, and they want to be able to have raw block access to those volumes. And so this new feature that is currently in beta, raw block volumes, is what they're going to be talking about today, and they'll tell you all about it. Please give them a warm welcome. Thank you. We appreciate the warmth. It's a little cold in here. All right, so fair warning, this may contain opinions, speculations, and bad jokes. These are entirely our responsibility and our fault and do not represent the views of Red Hat or the Rook project. All right, introductions. I'm Jose, over there on the, over there on the left. Um, I've been in and around storage for about 10 years. Uh, currently, I work in OpenShift Container Storage, or OCS. I participate in SIG Storage, and I like hitting things, mostly drums. Um, this over here is Rohan. He graduated from college in India in 2018. Um, he did a Google Summer of Code with the CNCF and worked on adding an NFS operator to Rook. Currently, he also works with OCS, focusing on the Rook upstream. And if you can't tell by now, he loves watching anime and riding motorbikes. All right, so here's a quick overview of what we're going to go through. We're at the agenda right now. We're going to go over some of the basics of storage in Kubernetes, uh, do another quick overview of raw block PVs, especially for those of you just filtering in, and introduction to Rook and Rook Ceph. Uh, then we'll get into the meat of it of how OSDs were, were, uh, have been provisioned and how, they're being pro how they can be provisioned now. And then we're going to have a nice little demo at the end. All right, so to set the stage, storage in Kubernetes. Um, your basic workflow uh, with storage these days involves persistent volumes uh, or PVs, persistent volume claims or PVCs, and storage classes, SCs. Um, the persistent volume represents a volume of storage in a storage subsystem somewhere. Um, different storage backends define what a volume represents. Um, but for the purposes of an application running in Kubernetes, they don't entirely care what's running down there. Um, and in particular, applications don't interact directly with PVs. They interact with persistent volume claims or PVCs, which represents a request to use a piece of storage that is available in Kubernetes. In particular, PVs are non-namespaced, so they're cluster-wide, but PVCs are namespace. And then you have storage classes, another non-namespace resource that basically provides a point of access where PVCs can dynamically provision PVs for, uh, for their use. Um, this is you know, a relatively recent development. Um, whereas previously, you'd have to statically define your PVs and then create a PVC that directly referenced that PV. Now, instead, you create a PVC that references the storage class, which talks to the storage driver underneath and creates the corresponding PVC. Here's a nice little graphic of that, where the developer uh, spe specifies the PVC and operations or infra or whatever specifies the storage class that the PVC is submitted to. It instructs the storage backend to create the persistent volume at the end. And then uh, the persistent volume is mounted by the application on whatever node it's, node it's running. Raw block PVs. So again, why raw block PVs? Um, it allows Kubernetes to present storage to containers without having a formatted file system on top of them. So uh, the reason for this is that many applications like databases or uh, software-defined storage um, can leverage storage directly at the block layer, meaning that you can cut out a lot of abstraction and indirection that file systems present. Um, this, allows, this typically allows for more consistent I.O. performance and low lat lower latency access to your storage. Uh, and you can find a link to more about how to use that down there. 
Um, the way you access this in your PVs and PVCs is through a new field called volume mode. Um, this went beta in Kubernetes 1.13. Um, and it specifies whether how a storage will be accessed, whether with a file system or as raw block. Um, as mentioned, the volume mode field is present in both PVs and PVCs, and then you can just leave it unspecified or specified volume mode file uh, to go with the backwards compatible default. Here is what it looks like for volume mode file. Again, um, this can be omitted since it's just the default. And you see over there on the far left, um, or stage left, um, that you just specify the volumes at the bottom with the PVC name, and then you mount, and then you specify that per container in the volume mount section. Volume mode block looks much the same from the PV and PVC level, but when you use your pod, you specify your, your PVC and then put it under the new, a new volume devices section, which, show, which tells Kubernetes where in the container that volume device should appear. A quick note here, uh, if you're familiar with this stuff at all, you're, familiar, you're probably familiar with access modes. Volume mode and access mode are not synonymous nor related. Access modes include things like read write many and read write once um, that controls how many pods may access, may attach a PVC at any given time and whether or not, whether or not how many of those pods can write to it. Um, where they intersect is that certain storage drivers uh, that, that allow raw block volumes may allow uh, various different access modes to their raw block storage depending on what the technology supports. Uh, this is usually a limitation of whatever technology is used to attach um, the storage to the node that the pod is running on. All right, now Rook and Rook Ceph. Um, what is Rook? Um, we have, uh, Rook is storage operators for Kubernetes. Um, it helps you automate various aspects of, your, of maintaining your data plane uh, from deployment to bootstrapping, configuration, and upgrade. Um, Rook, oper Rook is a collection of operators, which are piece, a piece of software that implement the operator pattern uh, for storage solutions, like uh, obviously Rookstuff here, but also EdgeFS and Minio. Um, and, and just a quick overview, the operator pattern uh, allows you to define a desired state for any given resource that you manage, or CRD, for instance. You've probably heard that before. Um, and then the operator works to reconcile the actual state of the cluster to match the desired state. Um, basically, it watches for changes in the cluster or in your desired state configuration um, and applies changes to the cluster to make the cluster state match the cluster desired state. Um, Rook Ceph was, is, uh, is the attempt to bring Ceph into containers to give you resilient distributed storage that is native to Kubernetes. Um, and in particular, it's self-healing, can recover from a variety of, uh, of error conditions. Um, and because it's Ceph, it is highly scalable, uh, can run on commodity hardware, and it's fully open source. Here is just sort of a quick overview of what a Ceph cluster looks like. Um, you don't need to know too much about the individual components that, can, that will be covered. All these things will be covered in talks later this week. Be sure to attend the Rook intro and deep dive on Thursday if you're interested. Um, the part we care about here is that uh, Ceph is divided into a number of daemons that produce uh, that, that have several functions. The one we care about are the OSDs that are towards the, in the, in the top corner there. Uh, this stands for, what is it? Object, sor object service daemon? Object storage. Object storage daemon. Um, and they are what represent the storage device into the Ceph cluster. Um, so now we get into OSDs. Um, how, they're provisioned, how they were provisioned and how they can be provisioned now. Um, the way this works uh, is that traditionally OSDs use uh, locally attached devices to your Kubernetes nodes. So what you would do is that you would set up you know, instances or physical machines 
with storage devices, and then you could specify how those storage devices would be used um, by Rook Ceph to build your Ceph cluster. Uh, at its most rudimentary configuration, using devices in this manner is really easy. Um, Rook, uh, Rook implements a auto discovery feature that looks through all your Kubernetes nodes or the Kubernetes nodes you limit it to um, and finds available, non-formatted, empty storage devices and just consumes some or all of those storage devices. So at its most basic configuration, you can just tell the storage subsystem to use all nodes in the cluster and use any free devices it finds on those nodes. Um, this is obviously mostly ideal if you're using a purely, uh, if you're using a Kubernetes cluster purely to host your data plane, but you can use a variety of node selectors um, and, and taints and tolerations to limit where the Rook Ceph pods will run. Um, so really all you have to do is define your storage nodes, define your local devices, and then Rook takes care of the rest. Um, it will prepare the storage devices for consumption by Ceph and then start the OSD pods on the nodes that contain those storage devices. On the upside, these things are easy to configure, and uh, for, especially for most storage administrators coming into Kubernetes for the first time, this is very familiar to them because they're very much used to attaching physical, di physical disks to physical nodes and then consuming them, especially if they're coming from the straight Ceph world and coming into Rook. This is very familiar to them, and in particular, this supports uh, any type of device or appliance that Linux supports, since all it looks for is a device on the node. Um, on the other hand, um, especially for, this is especially a concern for people deploying on cloud environments, this typically requires specialized nodes um, that may or may not be ideal when you're, de when you're trying to scale out and uh, deal, with no uh, deal with node failures that may occur. Um, and it provides, a, and it enforces a rigid coupling between compute and storage. Um, such that there's no real way to sort of easily spin up uh, uh, new storage cattle, basically. So we implemented a thing that ended up being called storage class device sets. Um, the procedure for setting these up is much the same as with local storage OSDs, except that now you define a desired amount of storage rather than the exact devices you want to use. Um, but as far as Rook Ceph is concerned, these end up being consumed in much the same way and presented to Ceph in the same way. So the main difference is that is in how you actually define the devices to be consumed. Storage class device sets were designed as a generic Rook struct and, as you, and if, you, if you remember, Rook is a collection of operators for multiple uh, storage services. Um, so the storage class device sets are not, you know, are fairly extensible and feature rich, but some features of them are not used in Rook Ceph. Um, we just use a small number. Uh, we just basically use what we need to get Ceph up and running. So the first thing we need to set is a name for your storage class device set. Um, this is used in part to generate unique and consistent PVC names for the PVCs that will be consumed by the OSDs, but it also helps internally to sort of to keep track of which device belongs to which set. Because if you can see on the second line there, this is actually a list of storage class device sets. Um, you can specify more than one set per storage cluster. And we didn't want to necessarily go with a straight map with a uh, with a map to uh, to set this up. So we just went with the list that of of named items. Now here we get to count. Count is the number of devices in this set. Um, so if you set a count to three, three OSDs will be spun up in association with this set. You could also, for instance, specify three different sets with a count of one. Um, to also get three storage, uh, uh, three OSDs uh, running in your cluster. And I'll explain more about that in a little bit. All right, 
Portable. Uh, this is the big feature for a uh, storage class device set, meaning that PVCs are allowed to move between nodes. Um, this is, in particular, an important configuration for Rookcef because this is how you trigger uh, the new behavior um, that, I'll, that will co uh, a new behavior that we had to come up with that we'll cover in a, in a little bit or in a little bit here. And then volume claim templates. This is just a list of PVC templates. Um, it follow it's uh, it just imports the standard spec. So if you've written any PVC, if you've written any PVC YAML, this should look very familiar. You specify the amount of storage you want, the storage class you want to provision against, volume mode block is a requirement here, and then any access modes that you want set for this PVC. Um, you can see that that is also a list. Uh, at the moment, we Rookcef only supports setting one PVC, uh, but this is uh, something we may be looking to extend in the future for more advanced OSD configurations. The pros of this, um, you can offload your device distribution to the Kubernetes scheduler, since uh, these things are just running as pods now. Um, the scheduler will take care of finding nodes with appropriate resources and scheduling or moving pods around uh, as needed. Incidentally, device migration between nodes is now possible. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Ceph is a self-healing uh, self -healing storage service, meaning that there, is a lot, there can be a lot, of, a, a lot of data traffic going around as it tries to rebalance how the various blocks are distributed across the cluster. If you have you know, multiple replicas across multiple failure domains, et cetera. Um, with device migration, as long as the device can migrate uh, quickly enough, uh, Ceph will just detect that the device is back and not need to perform any, and not need to perform any uh, data migration so, uh, since it will just uh, use the data that's already present on the disk. So no additional replication, no need to move anything around. Um, and this works with just any raw, uh, raw block PV, regardless of the storage driver underneath. So as long as, your, as long as your storage vendor supports using volume mode block on their PVs, uh, we can consume it. And of course, this is shiny and new. So it's very exciting, at least for me. Unfortunately, um, it's a bit bulkier to, to deal with than just, than just using local storage devices. Uh, you're, you need to have a predefined storage class um, that allows you to access your desired block volumes, such as a GP2 storage class in AWS. Um, the device support is not as robust as it is in just straight Linux. We are limited only to what, we are limited to only what Kubernetes supports. Um, and as you saw earlier, the configuration for this can get fairly extensive, um, and it's new and different, so it's natural to be skeptical of these things. All right, and now I'm gonna turn this over to Rohan um, to go over some of the bumps in the road that we found along the way to implementing this. So the first issue which we faced was when we mount the uh, block PVs on top of privileged containers, so we won't find our block PVs there because the slash dev is bind mounted into the container and uh, it prevents Kubernetes from presenting the block device at the desired path. To solve this, we use a, a little trick. So we use a non-privileged init container to copy the device as uh, the device is a file into the Linux system. So that uh, file was copied to a shared directory which was shared between the init container and the privileged container. Thanks to John for this. So if we look at the right hand side bottom, we have two volumes. One is the block PV, that is set one dev zero, and next we have an empty di uh, directory. So uh, if you look at the init container, it's basically just copying the uh, block device to the shared directory, and on the left hand side, we see we just have the shared directory mounted to the privileged container. So the next uh, issue which we faced was the OSDs, when we uh, spin up on the same node, like uh, we spin like 10 OSDs and three were on the same node, so one or two OSDs were failing. 
This was because when Chef Volume prepares the LVM, so we have slash drive mounted and Kubernetes mounts the block device as a loopback device. So when slash drive is mounted, we have the original device of the uh, node there as well as the loopback device. So uh, when we use the Chef OSG command to start, so it detects like the uh, LVM is having two PVs uh, linked to it. One is the loopback device and one is the actual device that's there. To simplify this, uh, to solve this, we just pass the ex uh, exact LV path, that is slash dev, the name of the VG, and then the name of the LV. The last problem which we faced was, so OSGs were clustering onto a same node. Suppose we, we, we spin 10 OSGs and we had three nodes, so like five to six OSGs were coming on, on the same node. So suppose we have uh, three replicas for the OSGs, so, and all three are on the same node, and if the node goes down, we lose our data. So which, was, uh, which is undesired. So to solve this, we use placement affinities. So uh, this is a basic uh, placement affinity that will distribute the OSGs around nodes. Now it's show time. So for the demo, we have an OpenShift cluster running up on AWS. And why do we have OpenShift cluster? Well, the main reason we have OpenShift, uh, an OpenShift cluster running is because Red Hat. You know, uh, we, it, we have a lot of internal automation to make it easy to set up an AWS cluster and run OpenShift. Uh, and in particular, we're going to be using a asp an, an aspect of OpenShift uh, for machine management, which makes it easy to uh, tear down and bring nodes back up um, from the OpenShift console. Cool. So we have three. Uh, hold on. Is the font OK for everyone, folks in the back? Bigger. Okay. Sorry? Do you got black on white? White on, white on black. On white. Yep. Cool. So we have three OSDs running on three different nodes. If you see here, it's uh, uh, one is on 178, one is on 168. Three, one is on 45. So we, uh, when we check the Ceph, uh, health, so we have three OSGs, three are up and three are in. Now we check the nodes. So here we have four worker nodes and OSGs are on three of them. So now we're accessing the OpenShift machine API to look at the machines that we have set up. Uh, the main thing to note for machines is that these machines are controlled by what's known as a machine set. And um, a machine set basically is, uh, allows you to just uh, like, a, like a replica set, for instance, its job is to through the, use of the, through the use of the machine set controller, um, or the OpenShift machine API, a, API operator, um, is to make sure that there are always enough machines to satisfy the needs of the machine set. So what we're going to do here is, delete, is uh, delete one of the machines that's part of a machine set so that it goes down and another one is being brought up. But since we don't want to wait for the next machine to be brought up, we're just going to uh, evict all the pods from the first machine we're deleting, and they should be brought up elsewhere. So uh, we have this OSG that is running on uh, IP ending with 163, and here is the machine for that one, which has uh, IP ending with 163. I will just copy the name of the machine, and we'll do OSG delete machine name of the machine, and the namespace. Here we go. So uh, when I deleted the machine, we see uh, an OSG went into the pending state. This is the new OSG that is coming up. One OSG that went off, uh, it vanished. So it is the OSG uh, that was there on the node which we deleted. And that OSG migrated to a new node which is uh, 178 in this case, and we will just wait for it to come up. Here we can see uh, one of the moon, mons is down because one of the non, uh, node went down, and 
three OSDs are there and two are up and three are in. So when this uh, comes back to the running state, we will see that the health is fine. It will take a while. Let's see. Uh, do an do an OC describe on the OSD pod. Oh yeah, it's, it's back up. Oh, there it goes. Yep. So, so it will uh, take a while uh, for the health to be back to normal. And oh. yeah, here it is. It's is going to get normal after the mon is up. I think that's all in it. Yep. Yep. So huzzah, we have our storage back up. And that was all in under a minute. Yep. All right. So that's the end of the demo. Pretty quick talk. Thank you. Now it's time for the questions. Yep. If you have any questions, feel free. If you want us to go back and touch on something a little deeper, we're happy to do so. We got the time for it. Uh, when you were talking about the OSDs, you mentioned about a manual and auto discover modes. Can you give us a use case for each one? Why would you need two discovery modes there? Why can't we just auto discover? Why can't you what? Be auto discover. Why would you need manual? Oh, why would you? Yeah. Why would you need manual? Um, as this is in particular if for some reason you have a mix of storage devices on a given node that you want to make sure and you want to make sure you only use a certain type of storage and not the other. Um, this comes from uh, this comes from the early days of how you run Ceph. Um, and in particular, you could run multiple Ceph clusters in the same Kubernetes cluster. So you could have, you could have the same node providing storage for different Ceph clusters. Uh, this is something that the Rook, that, that the Rook project uh, wanted to make sure that they, that they supported. But then also, it's a matter of, um, it could also be a matter of security policy, where you want to make sure that there is no like you can, you can add additional storage devices to the node, but you don't want them necessarily automatically consumed. So you want to manually change the configuration before they're consumed. Hi, uh, you mentioned the need for an init container to get, get a device into a privileged pod. Is there a way to run um, OSDs in an unprivileged fashion now that you can sort of directly get at the block devices, or is that a limitation of, of so that uh, doesn't work because uh, we need to use LVM, and LVM works only on the privileged containers. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, there's conflicts between the, I think it's with the namespaces, uh, the security namespaces when using LVM inside a container versus on the host itself. We got someone back there. Uh, with Rook, is it uh, possible to run you know, more than one OSD for each uh, device? Um, at the moment, no. You can only run one OSD per storage device. OK, so if I have like you know, NVMe or SSD, and that needs more OSDs to get the complete performance, that's not possible at the moment? Not at the moment, but we left room for that to be implemented down the road. OK, cool. Thank you. So yeah, if you want, if you want to contribute, patch is eagerly accepted. Sure. Hey, um, so uh, I, could, I didn't understood when you said that you were copying the data for, for the device. Could you explain why do you want to copy the data? So uh, we can't have the block device in the privileged container. So just to make sure that we have the blocked device in the privileged container, we were copying it to a shared directory, which was there in the init container as well as the privileged container. Yeah. So the init, con init container was a non-privileged container, and that has the block device attached to it, block PV. Yeah, we're not copying the actual data on the block device. We're copying the file that represents the block device in Linux from one location yes, to yes, the other, because yeah. you can do that. Yeah. Uh, regarding the privileged container, uh, why do you have to, like, you can add a capability, right? Security context? For Sorry, just for the purpose you. of the uh, LVM. 
Can you repeat the question? Uh, so you said you want to set prioritized is equal to true for the container. Instead, uh, you can uh, do it at the granular level, like uh, you can add what the capabilities required uh. for running that LVM. Yeah, unfortunately, um, we did try to narrow down just a set of capabilities that we could specify to the container, but we weren't getting anything that actually made LVM happy. So the only thing we could find that would actually make LVM function properly was to use privilege, was to have it run as privileged. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, one more question. Um, so when you are running with Kubernetes, I mean, when you are running Ceph with Kubernetes, uh, if a OSD fails, then Kubernetes might, want, might try to restart it on some other node, right? But the device, may not be the same, like you know, here I could have dev SDA, but there it could be dev SDE, right? H how do we handle those kind of situations? So right now we are using the AWS EBS uh, volumes because uh, they are portable, quite portable, and when they move from one node to another, it's the same device. But in case of uh, local storage provisioner, we have some complications there, and we are trying to get it fixed. Okay. Yeah, Thank so um, in particular, uh, Kubernetes for raw block creates a loopback device, which it uses to present the storage into the container. So we don't have to care where it's located on the host itself, because we just care about the volume device or the volume device file that is in the container. Anyone else? Oh, we got one over here, all the way on the other side of the room. Thank you, Saad. So sorry if I missed this, but so the when, once you create the Ceph cluster, the thing that's being exposed to the applications that are consuming this, are they consuming it as raw block devices, or is there a file system created somewhere, and if so, by whom? They can, but they don't have to. So there's the distinction between, now, that, now you have to make the distinction between the PVCs Ceph is consuming for its OSDs and the, PV, and the PVCs it provides for applications. These are two completely distinct sets. So you know, one uses the underlying storage provider like EBS or, or Azure Disk or whatever, and then Ceph just presents Ceph volumes. And if you're using uh, RBD volumes, you can consume those as either raw block or file volumes. So it will be some, up to something above this to create those, carve them up, create uh, file systems or LVs or whatever it is. Yep. Cool. Although typically applications that would want to use raw block devices don't need to format their own file system. Nope. Oh, oh, got one. How does it handle uh, multi-path, or when you have multiple paths to the same device? What does Discovery do? Do we have? We don't have any of the Rook maintainers here, unfortunately. That one I don't know. Um, my guess would be that, uh, are you talking about the local device auto-discovery? Yeah, if a fresh device is, uh, for instance, you just have uh, dual-ported drives, and so you, the same device shows up uh, as two instances, but it's the same worldwide device. OK. How yeah, do, I do officially don't know about that. You can feel free to bring that up in the Rook session later this week. OK, will do. Anyone else? This side has been a little sparse. Anyone? <laughs> Doesn't look like it. So I think that's it. All right, thank you. Thanks.